Welcome to the Contact Center Gurus, the podcast for contact center and customer experience leaders. Learn best practices, new technology, tips and tricks, and more. Listen in. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Contact Center Gurus. And my name is Jessica Voss. I'll be one of your co-hosts. And my name is Rob Enslow. I'll be your co-host today as well. And welcome right, today, to Contact Center be, Gurus. Yeah, uh, we're going to be talking about artificial friction and empathy with our guy, Andy Bird. Everyone must know him in the contact center world, but Andy, please uh, give an intro about yourself. Well, thanks, Jessica. It's good to be with you and Rob. Uh, always a pleasure. And, you know, it's, it's funny how much, you know, as we sit here and talk, we can reminisce about some of the old school things that we've done in this industry. And uh, I've definitely grown up in it. So, um, you know, just a little intro on myself. Uh, I've been around in the industry for 23 years. In Whoa. total. Yeah. <laughs> no. Your gray hairs. <laughs> gray hairs, they are there. They're yeah, all there. Yeah, I am like me. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, the beard looks better dyed. I don't know about the hair, so I just kind of let it go. Um, but yeah, started way back in the days of Lucent Technologies. Ooh. And got into contact center. I actually stumbled into contact center by selling a, a working on a deal. I should say selling, but working on a deal where we helped this weird little company start up an airline with all work at home agents way back uh, before 2000 hit. And nobody would start an airline back then. And this company did, and they remain today as JetBlue Airways. So that's wow. kind of how I got into all of it and then uh, migrated into product management because I was helping uh, them do that. And so just a long, fun career. Um, got to see everything from CCAS evolve to uh, where we are today in the industry with CPAS evolving. Oh, awesome. So and where are you at today? So today I work for Concentrix. We're actually one of the largest least known companies out there. Um, <laughs> and it's very Please true. Five, yeah, $5 billion organization. We primarily focused on BPO, but we do PPO and BPO and technology solutions. Um, I am responsible for the product group that includes product management, product marketing, product development, and business development for our CIT division of the organization. And um, just having a ton of fun, um, not only you know working here, but I've got a great team around me that uh, keeps me uplifted every single day and keeps me on my toes. Oh, fantastic! So, how long have you been there? Uh, six months now, so just a little over six months. Um, You're a baby. <laughs> no, it, it's I'm still my uh, my boss told me that I got to stop playing the new guy card after ninety days, and then she <laughs> extended it for a little while. So I've extended it as much as I can, but yeah, I don't get to pull the new guy card anymore. New ideas need to come out of uh, this mind and my team's mind constantly now. So okay, so are you vetting or bringing on new technology for your clients or yourselves, or where do you fit that in that role? Dang, good question. All of the above. So we, we, the way that we're kind of broken up is we, we're, we have 250,000 agents at Concentrix. And so we obviously consume lots of technology within our organization. And then we, uh, we also help, you know, all those customers that, that uh, allow us to, to take those interactions for them uh, with their technology. And then we have customers that don't even want us to do um, the personnel or the people behind it. And so they just want us to do their technology for them. And so we end up getting all the above and we, we really have, I don't know, I'd really like to say we have one of the most unique wherewithal in far, as far as A to Z goes when it comes to contact center, because it really doesn't matter what you want, you have or where your need is, we can typically fill that gap one way or another with the way that we've set up our integration and our managed services. Okay. And you guys have a global footprint? Yes. Uh, again, your questions are amazing. But um, yes, uh, we, we, are, we are global. So we've got big presence, obviously, in North America. But yeah, ANZ, so Australia, New Zealand area, and then um, all throughout Europe, as well as uh, Asia. So we do tons of work 
uh, across the globe. Okay. So I got to ask, since you deal with a lot of clients, is around AI and automation. So I know this probably comes up a lot from a lot of your clients. We're hearing that all the time. So first off, what is contact center AI and why should a company, company use it? Yeah, I think it's, that, is, that is one of the classics. AI has become our big buzzword in the industry right now. Right? Really big. It's like where cloud was, right? <laughs> yeah, it's where cloud was in 2012, right? Everybody was talking about cloud. I mean, I remember sitting with some of the big analysts uh, back in the days of in contact and, and talking with those analysts and talking, hey, where's your cloud magic quadrant? And they're like, oh, it's not quite there yet because they weren't sure what the adoption was going to look like. Um, so it, I, there, there are some, some similarities and I think there's some differences. AI is a technology that people use the term so loosely. And, yeah. and Rob, you know how this, this goes when, when you have a technology that gets just thrown out there for everything as an all encompassing blanket uh, to just cover all the bases. And, uh, and so what, what we see here in the market is everybody wants to be, uh, in fact, there's even, instead of .com, you can have .ai. Not everybody realizes that, but if you didn't learn anything else, that's a small piece of information you learned here is you can go buy a domain with .ai. That's, that's how big AI, .io. I see those as the two biggest ones. Yes, .ai and .io. And I, I don't even know where .io gets attributed to always because it seems to be a, all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Especially with tech companies. Yeah, tech, AI, yeah. SaaS, yeah. But it, it doesn't... Is it, is it, you, do you see any segregation there, Rob? Of the I know. <laughs> <laughs> not, not necessarily. No, I yeah. mean, there's, there's some big ones, outreach.io. Yes. Uh, marketing companies that have adopted it, uh, Rocket Fuel. Oh. Uh, .io. So there's a couple companies that come, uh, come to the top of my head, but, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. What, what do you think, uh, Andy, in terms of, you know, the relevance of AI. Why is AI relevant to the contact center? You know, now more than ever, I, th I guess I would say, because it's been, it's been, so, I would say that, it, that it's been relevant for quite some time. It has. We've, we've always had automation in the contact center. And so whether oh, you're yeah. calling it a bot or you're calling it automation or you're calling it AI, there's always been that reality. The, the new buzzword is just AI. Let's do some artificial intelligence, you know, right? Let's get the Terminator and, and Skynet <laughs> into the context. I would love if I called a company and Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice answered and helped me out. That actually I don't want him to say I will terminate you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. I'll be back. back. <laughs> I'll be back. I've come for you. Yeah. I'm in front of um, yeah, no, actually, that would actually be pretty cool if somebody said that. <laughs> right? I know, huh? But, you know, they, we've got this whole AI thing going on and everybody is just tacking onto it. And so any, but anytime anyone can do any type of pattern recognition or any type of deflection, they immediately attribute it to AI. And I don't know that I get to be the one that makes the definition of what AI is and what's not, but typically it has to meet a couple criteria. And, and in the context that I'd say, it has to have pattern recognition so that it can make decisions in the future. So it's got to have pattern recognition. It's got to have some type of vectoring scheme that lets it make decisions uh, real soon after the fact or at some point in the future. And, and it's, got to be, it's got to be able to run on its own, right? So those are three very basic criteria. And I'm not sure all AI out there does that. But whenever a company has any semblance of that, they immediately go, we've got AI, right? Because they've got a, a, a part of that. And AI's best play in the contact center is really typically thought of always as deflection, right? So it's yeah. how do I not have any reaction? Deflect it going to an agent or front end conversations. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and so so you you know as you look at where that works the best, um, and I'm sure you're even going to ask this in the contact center is there is the front end of the, the call, right? The pre-interaction, I should, I like to call it, during the interaction, post-interaction, and then anything that sits outside for the routing or behavior of the interaction. So those are the four areas that AI can be used. And so if they're doing that pattern recognition and they're making automated decisions, then I think it can be attributed that way. The real question is, is how far do you go with AI 
And what does that do to the overall contact center and that whole entire experience? And, and I don't know that everybody's always gauging that, you know, as it goes through that process. We're, uh, Jessica's going to get to this later, but um, what, what would you say uh, out of those four is the most relevant? Depends on what you're looking for. I love that question. And because it really depends on what you look for. If you're looking for deflection, obviously pre-call, right? Or pre-interaction, uh, I'd say, because that's where you're gonna get your most deflection. It's also, which we'll talk about, is where you're gonna get the most artificial friction or artificial frustration that you can possibly get in the contact center. Um, the the, the post-call AI is typically done on sentiment analysis. And so that's the second most used. And then during the call is third and outside of the call is typically fourth. And that's where I've seen it implemented, not necessarily sold to, but implemented um, in that order based upon the value that it brings. Because deflection obviously brings more value than anything else. Yeah. Well, how, how, would, um, how would a call center get started? Uh, so where, where's a, a good place to start? I always think a good place to start is really by taking, is doing an analysis of where you have the biggest issues. And if it's staffing of your agents and making sure that rote, repeatable things need to be taken care of quicker and sooner, then you're gonna go pre-call, which lends itself to being, I mean, just, just between us, don't, don't tell anybody else this, lends itself to be the vast majority of those, of, of most customers. However, I will say that there's a lot of customers that still need to figure out how to increase their CSAT levels. They want to increase their NPS scores and they need to, they need to deal with some of the on-call reactions or during the, I always call on-call, but during the call interactions and make changes there. And the post, the sentiment analysis will help with that as well as that, you know, putting a automated supervisor there, more or less, that's what I'm calling it, but somebody there to listen in as you're going and make suggestions can be very helpful in that regard. But really to answer your question, I'm almost always going to say pre-interaction. -pre yeah, so I had a question about um, companies that there's so much AI out there that they're kind of getting overwhelmed. Uh, with AI this, AI that, AI that, <laughs> yeah. RPA that, IVA that, conversational AI that, <laughs> QA that. Um, so is, will AI be beneficial to one, any size contact center? And two, the second part of the question is, if a customer has not already adopted AI, where should they start? Like, where is a good place not to just start, but would be uh, the least resistant? Mm. <laughs> no, I get maybe, it. Uh, easily to deploy, um, get their toes wet. Um, but yeah. So let's break that that question down because it's a, a, yeah. a, another good one. The as far as size of the company, we've seen especially in the disruptor market, which if you're familiar with is typically sub 100 agent, but it is a disruptor, meaning they're doing something different in their industry. So Uber was a disruptor at one point in time, right? Because they were disrupting all, um, you know, travel in that regard. And, and, you know, I'm sure you guys have both used an Uber or a Lyft multiple times, but Uber was definitely on that board. And in the disruptor market, uh, AI is phenomenal. So it really depends. It's, it's, sometimes it depends on the size, but then I, I had the, the, a similar question come to me the other day. Does enterprise really need to use AI? And they do as well, because they're always looking for efficiency gains. So it really, the, the, the size of the company doesn't necessarily predicate whether or not you need AI or not. It really comes down to what your value prop is. And it's the same thing is, do you have enough metrics going on in your contact center on a regular basis to really know where your bottlenecks are and what your customers want when it comes to how they want to interact with you. I mean, who knew that messaging was going to become so prolific, um, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, it really, it was, it was really hard because we all had phones that you had to, you know, use the, the, the five key for three different letters, right? For J, K, and L. 
And so you had to figure out. So texting wasn't a big deal back then, but today it's, it's across the board. So the, the idea there is how do your customers want to interact with you? And so disruptors tend to allow them or lend themselves a little bit more to more of the adopters in consumers. And so it, it's almost the qualification, not just on size, but on where you fit within your, your existing market. And I would say that AI can be used anywhere, especially, I mean, if I'm a CEO and I'm doing a startup company, even if I'm not a disruptor, but I'm just a startup company, and I don't have the wherewithal or the budget to be able to put butts in seats, I can utilize AI to still supply some type of customer interaction and uh, take it to the next level from there. So that's a good use case. And like I said, when you get to the enterprise, it's sometimes it's that middle area that gets the most ne neglected. So that 100 to 500 seat area gets the most neglected with AI, although they tend to be early adopters for new technology, this one doesn't seem to provide as much benefit as the much more the enterprise, 500 seats and above and the, the sub 100s. So um, they, they have to have a, a good analysis done. And as far as getting your toes wet, I, like I say, I'm almost always going to advocate for that, that pre-interaction. And in that pre-interaction, you can usually find out a lot. You're going to find out a lot about your Customer interactions, you're going to see if you're going to actually cause that artificial friction. Because, you know, I always I use an example of I just recently bought um, an outside smoker and I bought the smoker. Oh. And, <laughs> yes. And, and I make it up. Okay oh, what kind of smoking? No, I'm just kidding. Might have to make it trip out to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> We've got good barbecue. Come on out, Rob. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I bought one because, you know, here I am in Texas and everybody's got their smokers going all the time. And I wanted to join in the fray. And I bought it. And after I bought it, my son and I were lifting it up. And we'll blame this on me for sure. On the concrete after putting it together and I scratched it like you wouldn't believe. So here I am with a brand new smoker that I'm treating like a, a car, right? Yeah, <laughs> you're all waxing it and oh, baby. <laughs> Kissing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I love that thing. You got a cover for it. <laughs> I do. I have a cover for it. I wipe it down after every use and clean it out. And it's got a digital thing that tells me when I need to clean it out too. And it's got a mobile app. So, I mean, it's got all the things that you would want. And here I am with that. And um, I scratched the crap out of it and just totally ruined, you know, my new toy. And you know, Rob, you know how it is when you get a new toy. You, want to <laughs> keep <toys>. it nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I drive a Jeep because, because I like sitting there fiddling with things, right? So um, I, di I did that and, and I was like, and my son tells me, he's like, you know what, you should just give, uh, you should just give the company a call. And I was like, no, we did it. It was our fault. I, I'm blaming it. I mean, I never blame it on my 13 year old son, but um <laughs> It was, it was, it was, it was, it was our fault. And he goes, yeah, dad, give him a call. So I called them just out of the blue. And I, and when I called a couple of interesting things happened in this experience, a, I was immediately sent to an agent. There was no, there was nothing. It was just, I was sent to an agent. Mm -hmm. It rang until an agent picked up the phone and they said, we do not recognize your number. Are you a new customer? And I said, yes, and I gave them all my information. And they're like, oh, so you just recently purchased it. And I said, yeah. They said, well, welcome to the XYZ family because I'm not you know, uh, gonna you know, advertise for them at this point in time yet. But I, and I said, well, thank you. And, and they said, so what can we do for you? Did you need to order pellets or anything? And I said, no, no, I, I scratched it when I was building it and it's really bad. And they said, well, you're part of our family now. We'll send you out a replacement. I said, oh, do you want me to send the old one back? And they said, no, absolutely not. Just send you what? a replacement so that you can have a shiny new smoker, which oh, by the way, it's going to get smoke all over and look like crap in a couple of weeks. I found out anyway. Are you going to gift the other one with a scratch? <laughs> oh, it's incredible. So they, they sent me out and, and granted, it, 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 so that was amazing. I mean, we're talking about a thousand dollar investment here yeah. and they're just that willing to just make that happen. But the couple things that just stood out to me, they understood they, that I needed empathy because I was a first time customer. So they didn't put me through an automated system. So artificial intelligence doesn't play there necessarily, at least for this type of a purchase. 
Two, they realized during that process, and I didn't know this until after the fact, until I did research on them, they also had an artificial intelligence helping them during the call. So that one is suggesting that they use the word family in the way that they talk. And it also suggested that they just send out a replacement. So all the rules that a supervisor normally would have done were all given to the agent in the scripted form. And they did that. And by the way, I've told that story now 12 times. And I know <laughs> at least eight people have gone out and bought that smoker. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and they understood the lifetime value of a customer, clearly. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, but, but more importantly, decided to do something about it. Right. Took action on it. Now, you'd show me an automated system that has the ability to make that distinguish, distinction. And, and it's gonna, you're going to be pretty hard-pressed to find one. Yeah. Now, it's interesting you say that and you talk about how, you know, how do your customers like to engage with you? How do they want? I mean, even just uh, this morning, you know, we... we um, we were on the phone with, with a massive car dealership. Uh, you know, it has over a hundred locations down in Mexico and they don't use text. It's just, it's their culture. They, they do not, look, when they, when somebody text, gets a text message, they look at it like, oh, it's just like, it's like but, but if somebody sends a WhatsApp, they're like, oh, who's WhatsApping me? It's right. weird. It's the, that's, that's like their culture. So, so on their website, they have a WhatsApp widget. And that's just the way they do things. And so that's, that's their preference. Yes. They, they were having an issue with, you know, the monitoring of, of, uh, of WhatsApp, you know, and being able to control that when it, you know, it's, we got 20 to 50 different people, you know, at any given time monitoring that. In any case, I guess, is there, is there such a thing as over automation? Yeah. You say? I, I would. Examples? I, I, what was that last one? Can you give any examples just off the top of your head? Yeah, um, there is. There, there's, a, there's a problem with over automation, and this is where it leads into my whole theory. Um, and I, I, I'm definitely, it's not necessarily all mine. I think several people share it, where you get into the artificial fr friction and frustration where I'm stuck in an automated system and I can't get a human <laughs> being for empathy, oh, right? We've all experienced that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Doesn't it just remind you of that that episode of Seinfeld? Why don't you just yeah, tell me what movie you want to see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, because he's trying to be an IVR. He's like, press one if you want to see Top Gun. Press exactly. two if you want to see Dancing, you know, with wolves and then <laughs> he's like and they press it and he doesn't he doesn't do tone recognition so he's like why don't you just tell me what movie you want me to see <laughs> so it was um it, that 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 is where ai gets into a problem and it, and it's so the old ivr frustration has now become even more prolific because they want so hard to do deflection that they almost go you know, if, if they had a target of 30% deflection, they always are reaching for more. So they go for 35% deflection, which ends up cost, costing them that amount of customers yep. because they went over <laughs> that much. So making the right that yeah. determination is hard. Oh my goodness. I, well, you just reminded me of, so I can just see, I would love to be in an IVR meeting, you know, uh, for a bank. I don't care. You pick any bank. IRS. I would love. I, I, could, <laughs> I could save them a hundred grand of meeting time by just walking in there and saying, "Go straight to an agent and walk out." <laughs> Go, yeah. that's, that's it. Period. Don't forget about the IVR. Let's have another number for that for payments. Well, here's one right. number for you want to make a payment. Here's another number for you know. <laughs> but if you want to talk to an agent. Let's go straight to an agent. And I just think that, you know, because I've even experienced myself with my own bank. And my, I have one, one of my banks is a credit union. And the credit union explored AI. We'll just say that. I'm not going to say who it is. But they, they explored AI. And it was the most frustrating thing. You know, I was at each time I was saying agent, 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 until finally it's, hold on, we'll just connect you with an agent. You know, so <laughs> So, so yeah, it is very true. And fight, you know, so have you ever, have you ever stopped to think about why financial it's so important to have an agent? It's people's money. <laughs> Got it. What's more valuable to us as Americans than anything else? Money. <laughs> yeah. When you can't get through. Yeah. I mean, so when I'm dealing with money, 
And this is where you get, I mean, fintech, you know, all financial technology, right, is where you get into this horrible thing of, I want to talk to somebody because I want them to know because I have my money with you, whether that's $10 or $10,000, you care about what my daughter who's working right now, you know, uh, for a job, she cares her $400 in her bank account matters to her. And you're not to, to mess with that in any way, shape or form. And so, yeah, you want, you want to have somebody because you want to know that there's somebody behind there doing something other than the Terminator robots, you know, <laughs> managing your money on the back. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually have a different perspective. Ah. On, yeah. <laughs> go, go, Jess. I yeah, go for love it. for myself as a customer of someone else. Self-service, automation, you know, I want to, you know, handle things on my own without agents. I mean, I do want to talk to an agent if it's an emergency. I'm, I'm missing ten thousand dollars for my bank account. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. I don't want to get stuck in the IVR, but IVRs are advancing to IVAs to where AI is becoming more and more intelligent. And if they can handle whatever I'm requesting, like your barbecue exchange, well, I love how Amazon makes exchanges or returns flawless and they don't really you know involve you know agents really i click a couple buttons i have a problem return it so i would love that same experience (laughs) whether i call or email or chat uh to involve some sort of automation now i think it's more of a balance between ai and agents that's the that's the key to the game because also Every single one of us wants a different experience that makes us happy. So whatever makes me happy is my experience. It might be different from you, Rob. You probably want to go directly to an agent all the time. <laughs> me, I'm like, no agent anytime. Safety all time. It's the last resort, please. <laughs> but it's circumstantial. So that's the problem that's happening with contact centers is trying to appease all of us. I mean, look at us all right now as human beings. We have different you know, political views and then COVID views and family views and <laughs> living views. So that's the same as the customer experience views. Now, I can tell you in another experience with a healthcare insurance company that I will not name, but I will never do business with them again. And it was simply me submitting a medical claim, okay, to them because it was an out-of-network provider. I've submitted claims many, many times in my many, many decades, years of experience working. <laughs> we'll all, two, all, all, all two decades. We got yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> all two decades or plus. <laughs> and a long story short, I kept having to submit the same claim 20 times over the course of four months. And it kept routing to a different agent every time. You know, you submit a form or routes to an agent. The agent says, oh, this is missing. And I'm like, no, it's all right there. And I have to circle it, send it back. Oh, it gets to a different agent. Okay, we'll process this. Awesome. Okay, the process goes to a different agent. No, I'm sorry. We for, it's not there. I have to resubmit it. All this time <laughs> for four months, never got resolved. I quit interacting with them. I do not like them to this day. I will not select them if an employer or anyone offers me their insurance. (laughs) So that's something maybe AI could have helped with or some kind of intervention, recognizing, okay, she keeps submitting the same claim or the same inquiry and it's not being resolved. Someone jump in there, please (laughs) help me out. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so that's my perspective. I think Andy solved that problem 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, of course. I know, 20 years ago. But that's where Only that insurance know. company knew who Andy was. Yes. Oh. You'll just have to send me their name later, Jessica. I'll <laughs> school, we'll six sales all over. Them, so. Yeah, yeah. Fix the problems. Fix oh, the problem. <laughs> so there's so many areas that would fall under automation, especially relating to the customer experience. Um, but you know, what exactly would fall under automation? 
Is it a simple machine learning app, a bot, uh, aging guidance? I feel like there's a, a lot out there, and I mentioned this earlier, <laughs> there's a lot of acronyms and terms, but, but what would actually fall under automation? Is it all of the above? Yeah, it, automation is considered by the industry as a whole, all of the above. The, the challenge is, is I think it still needs to meet the three criteria that I set up at the beginning, right? Can it do patterns? Can it be actionable, right? And, and can it learn? So can it, can it adapt over time? So if those three minimum criteria, it can be implemented in any one of those areas. And you said it best, Jessica. It, this is a balance. This has to be a balance because you do have different consumers and you do have different industries. It's interesting how much less sensitive you are about health insurance and more, sen more sensitive some people can be about financial. Right? And, and so I won't say all people, but this is a, yeah, a general <laughs> sense, right? It's different for every person. So Healthcare can be less sensitive than financial and, and vice versa. And your car could be more sensitive than anything else. Your and my barbecue, dad, I mean, could be your baby. My barbecue, my dad's Harley. I mean, <laughs> the, that that could be the, the most sensitive thing because, you know, we know that, you know, not to get into my childhood, that he always preferred the bikes over the kids. So um, you're supposed to laugh. That was a good Yeah, that was funny. He never did. <laughs> I had a great dad. You should have said barbecues because then I would have been like, oh, that's where he got it from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a Harley rider through and through. Um, so we just we have to we have to elicit this balance. And again, that comes back to process and assessment. And even on your healthcare example, there is a process that people need to go through before they implement AI. You can't just get sold by the shiny object. You've got to know your contact center inside now. So if there's anything that I would suggest to them, to anyone who's watching this, is make sure you know your metrics. Yeah. Make sure you know where your pain points are. Make sure you know where your bottlenecks are and see how your customer sat's doing. Fortunately for healthcare companies, they're typically not rated on customer sat, right? They're only rated on keeping you awesome. away. As, <laughs> yeah, as, as long or as far as possible. Yeah. And I would suggest people get to know their customer experience as leadership and maybe even agents too. Like I, I've run into a lot of companies where they don't even know their customer journey or customer experience, like documented. Like I've talked to so many people, oh, I didn't know there was 10 options on the menu. I'm like, what? <laughs> you don't <Right>. know that? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother podcast that we can do. Yeah, that is. <laughs> the IT dilemma. So um, that's, my, that's my phraseology for that. But you, you got to know when to have empathy. You got to know when to prevent artificial friction. And you've got to, you've got to be able to assess where that you're right, that journey and where I can optimize that journey. Cause there's always patterns. You can always find patterns. Even if the commonality mean is, you know, a 3.5 out of five, that commonality is enough for you to justify doing, taking some actions to make sure that, you know, you're either giving more interaction where necessary or more automation where necessary. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we've talked a little bit about, you know, where in the contact center uh, AI is most effective. And, and even within those, those four areas that you outlined, uh, what would you say is the most effective application of that that you've seen? So this is something you've seen happen it's a case study what's the what's the biggest impact you've seen you know in any one of these four channels that, that you've actually seen yourself and i'll go first please um so so i've seen so we, have a, <laughs> we have a kind of, it's rhetorical so cloud tech gurus we have a we have a conversational ai tool uh that uh has generated over 25 million dollars in additional revenue for one of their clients and and these guys you know, essentially have a conversational AI tool that connects into your taps, into your database, existing opt-ins, uh, old opt-ins, begins SMS conversations. Once they mature enough, they're then transferred via warm transfer calls to the call center. And so that's, that's um, you know, one example, you know, where within a year's time, I mean, these, these guys are generating over $2 million a month now from this tool. Uh, and uh, so, so anyways, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, uh, you know, any similar outcomes that were staggering even. 
Yeah, the, 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 I've got a good example, which by the way, you'll have to uh, just go ahead and message me the name of that company because I have interviewed now 26 AI companies. Oh yeah, and that's, <laughs> that, is, that is a good one up on the list to have a, a story like that for sure, Rob. So I'm definitely yeah. interested in chatting with them. Um, one of the one of the big things that's occurred since the pandemic is retail has changed. So my example is in the retail. Retail right now has changed significantly because more people are buying online. And so it has moved a lot of those people that were normally up at the storefront for customer service, for returns, for even questions into home-based contact center agents. And so you've seen a lot of that. And very recently, I just... Uh, was able to be a part of a whole entire retail revamp strategy for one customer. We're now doing it for another customer where we have abs done all the deflection. It's 28% right now, deflection of those calls going to those home agents, utilizing AI. So we've been able to do that. We've been able to do that from a messaging standpoint. Their messaging went up tremendously. It was like 180. It was something ridiculous in the 180% range. Uh, when the pandemic hit. So the call volume went, was, was going up, but the messaging went up even higher. And so they were able to deflect those because managing those as an agent was getting very, very cumbersome. So we're able to deflect uh, you know, up to 28% of those calls, which was huge. And then we did one other thing, and that is we're able to do sentiment analysis on those messages. So we're using backend interaction on messages and or calls to see how to serve that customer better in the future. So if you call in and uh, Rob will just say it's a, it's underwear for men and you were to call in and, uh, or you were to message in and you were to do a return. Based upon, all the time. So yes, I know you example. do. Rob's yeah. our VIP <laughs> You wear the best underwear for men. So um, not that I know, I've just heard. So, but the- That's <laughs> got my name on it and everything. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a link to that too. <laughs> Please do. Envlo.ai. <laughs> Why underwear? Self serve. Completely self service automated. I love <laughs> AI. So if you were to use some terminology in there, like this was crap or something else like that, in your message over, the next transaction you have goes immediately to uh, an agent at that point in time. And that has transformed their CSAT and taken their CSAT up and um, all their scores across the board have gone up tremendously. So it's only been up in the 17% range, but that's still very, very substantial. So that's where I've seen AI implemented very, very well in, in a place that I didn't expect, you know, two years ago for it to be that big of a deal. But retail is, is massive. Healthcare, we're seeing it. I really... To be fair, healthcare again. insurance companies, listen up. That's, that's <laughs> no kidding, right? Um, we'll give you I, Andy's mobile number. I'll send you that <laughs> link to Andy. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I'll put my whole business use case together, and there you go. To seal the deal. <laughs> I love it. You know, the one place I really wish it would be enacted more, and we could have some success stories. Don't tell anybody, just us and whoever's watching. Yeah, just us girls. Public the public sector? Come hey. on, DMV. There's an oh idea. Oh, All public sector. I mentioned IRS earlier, didn't I? Oh, my I gosh. I don't know if they have the budget for it. <laughs> no, there's ROI, though. There, there is. There's, there's there. ROI. Jessica's right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, that, not enough. Yeah. There, there's ROI. They just don't know how to calculate it properly because they still are using typewriters, probably. Just kidding. No, anyone that works in public sector, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, Andy, I think uh, your perspective is interesting. And I've, I've heard, it, well, Jessica, I think, is more, thinks more along the lines um, of where, you know, the example that you gave. Um, and, and Jessica, yeah, if, if you don't mind sharing kind of what you've seen in the, you know, kind of the, that, that agent assist space. Because I know you, you kind of are. Yeah, I come up with yeah, on this. I come across that a lot, and what it's doing is it's collapsing or consolidating KMS, so knowledge-based management tools, and scripting into one, and a little bit of RPA. So customers are looking for a better way to arm agents with the right knowledge in order to assist. Uh, customers and, and whatever they need. 
So I'm actually seeing that one a lot <laughs> come up. I, I've seen it as well, Jessica. You're exactly right. The knowledge base is in a really weird spot right now in the in customer uh, interaction or customer engagement across the board of the knowledge base players that are out there today. And scripting is becoming much more prolific and automating that has been widely beneficial, right? We see MPS scores go up all the time in that area because of it. So yeah, it is I, mean, I always feel bad when I'm talking to an agent and it's kind of taking forever because I mean, I live in this world, so I have empathy for the agent that's taking forever trying to find the information to give me. But the majority of people don't understand and they actually blame the agent or they get frustrated with the agent because we're all impatient now. 10 seconds of waiting, we're like, oh, come on, <laughs> while I'm texting and typing at the same time and on, on a call. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're so impatient. So you're watching a TikTok it. while you're waiting on Yeah, hold. you're doing like, <laughs> I need more hands. So something that comes up from clients though is around, I don't like AI right now because customer experience still needs agents that have emotion and empathy and they don't really want someone automated to assist a client. So what's kind of your viewpoint on that? And then I'll show you, share with my viewpoint. <laughs> hey, I want to hear this. I think it's all about qualification, the types of calls. If I want to know my balance, I need no empathy. None. <laughs> I mean, um, Yay, you it's... have negative $585. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Unless it's really low, of course, then maybe I need some consolidation in which you probably should dial a different number, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if I want to know my, the, the status of my flight, again, I don't need empathy unless it's been delayed, yeah. right? So it's it's all these pre-qualifications, unless, unless, right? So it's it's a matter of what's going on. This is where intelli contact centers need to become intelligent overall is where empathy is going to be needed. We all understand humanity. You know, if I'm going to deliver you bad news, oh, it would be awesome to deliver that with some empathy around it, rather than your flight's been delayed till tomorrow. We'll see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Please be on time and go through security, right? I mean, it's, that doesn't, then I'm just pissed. And now I'm looking for the next Motel 6 or, or Marriott, depending on what your preference is. I know there's some, Motel 6 has got a, a card base. Oh, system. completely. You know, <laughs> and it's it's so simple. It really is. I mean, if I mean, I guess in the example of let's say they're in LA, uh, sitting there at LAX, you know, say, hey, your flight's delayed, but between now and 8 a.m. tomorrow, we're picking you all up. Buses will be here in 30 minutes. We're going to Disneyland, you know, on us. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that imagine will you fly with them again probably absolutely <laughs> you know and, and i would get in lots of trouble at disneyland too so <laughs> ride every roller coaster especially when you go uh, bankrupt at disneyland you, <laughs> <a lot of bank. laughs> you just checked your balance <laughs> so my take on some of these questions that come up from customers around not using ai because they want emotion empathy and I agree when it's an escalated interaction involved or sensitive interaction involved. I absolutely think a real person <laughs> should be assisting that, that customer. Like I've been on chatbots where you can tell, you know it's a chatbot, but they're like, yippee, and hello, wonderful day. I mean, I know it's a chatbot, but they try to bring emotion to that conversation. Yeah. And me being in this interview, like I said, I know it's a chatbot, so it doesn't really affect me. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe others are like, you know, completely fine and don't know it's a chatbot because chatbots, email bots, digital bots, are becoming or they're trying to become you know more realistic more human-like i mean there's so many people elon Musk, that are trying to get to that next gen ai and and whatever he's building <laughs> that one looks like a will smith movie what he's building but uh i think like, like that's kind of like the direction <laughs> ai is going to become more human-like and yeah, that, that, for me it's still the, like i i don't like it me personally but maybe other people are fine with that like i've heard voice AI bots that sound exactly like a human being. 
Oh yeah. Um, outbound sales, inbound sales. You can't tell. They take they can do, you know, um, a thousand different, you know, conversational, you know, redirects or whatever it may be. And I'm like, wow, that sounds so real. Um, but but me, I, I still want that a real person <laughs> in, in an escalated situation or an important situation. Yep, I, I, I total agreement from me on that part. That's really where you do the pre-qualification is. Yeah. Where is that going to be needed? I don't know. They, they're, they're, they're faking it really well right now when it comes to, you know, adding some emotive qualities yeah. to those interactions with the AI. I yeah. don't know how far that's going to go. I mean, I, if, you know, if we ever get to the point where, you know, Jessica, we can play a joke on Rob and, you know, <laughs> use an automated system on him and he buys it, then I know that we're making progress. Hey, everybody on Twitter is a real person, okay? <laughs> well, we don't well it reminds me of that movie, Her. Have you seen that movie, Her? I don't think so. I haven't. Have With you Joaquin watched? Phoenix? Oh, my God. Watch it. Everyone listening in, watch that movie because that's kind of like the direction I see them going into where people are, like, falling in love with these virtual things. <laughs> wow. Virtual voices and, you know, virtual AI and bots. Um, your your yeah. new match.com profile might be a bot. Seriously, but if you think about all the VR that's out there, the, the 5D, the holographic videos I'm seeing where there's big shark in a gymnasium pops out of the floor. <laughs> yes. I mean, my, my, of... my son makes me play the Oculus. I can only do it for about 20 minutes, though, before <laughs> it's, you, know, you start getting dizzy, but it's fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, that what's interesting about that, there's, there's a concept. Uh, you know, of, of um, that, that a BPO is applying actually out in Pennsylvania. Um, and my, the name of the, uh, of the BPO escapes me, but I, I can look it up for you. But it's uh, essentially what they're doing is they're, they're creating a virtual environment. So, so with, <laughs> with that same technology where the customer will put on virtual goggles and, you know, they'll essentially sit down in a waiting room, you know, cause they're, the third person, you know, in queue. <laughs> and then they'll go into a room, sit down with the agent virtually. Yep. Uh, oh, I need to change my password. Oh, okay. Glad you came in today. <laughs> yep. And uh, we'll see how that works out. But uh, pretty interesting to kind of see where, where, this, where this is headed. No, it's, yeah. it's very true. Uh, Rob, I've seen a couple of different pieces of software that are trying to emulate you know, not only the waiting rooms, but even office space. So, you know, you can yeah. see Rob's over getting a cup of coffee, a virtual cup of coffee when you're just really standing by the water cooler, you know, and yeah. you can go over, just meaning you're available and I can go over and then we can do a video chat. So seeing lots of interesting stuff, you know, video, we always thought video was going to, to be the next big thing with the pandemic going on and yeah. it's taken off, but it's usually one way video, not two way because not all agents want to be on camera or right. maybe should be on camera yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, well, I totally yeah. Agree. yeah. I, what's interesting to me is is and this is kind of where where i would like to see it go in terms of you know call center supervisors and call center managers um i would love to see a tool provide to them where they could put on you know some virtual goggles and be able to see which agents you know, uh, what they see on their dashboard just through those goggles walking around, you know, and have different colors over each agent and be able to actually see what's going on with data coming out at them, you know, for and maybe uh, even with the team leads having just their team, you know, yeah. you know they're in their perfume. So, so uh, you, you just yeah. came up with an idea for a virtual dashboard. Precisely. And I love it. I know that it can be done, uh, but oh. uh, nobody seems to want to do it yet. Well, you Can know, do it, please, and then come. Write it down. I was just going to say, you know, with I'll, tech gurus. I'll, I'll talk to the team. <laughs> Maybe we'll have something for you here in September. <laughs> oh, um, <beta. laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Andy. This has been fantastic, and I feel like we could talk another hour. So you might have to really? have another session in a couple months. <laughs> if, it, if it's with you guys, I'd love it. So <laughs> perfect. All right. Well, thank you. And I hope everyone enjoyed this episode and we will see you later. Thanks all. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for listening to the contact center gurus podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe, and we will see you next time.